Please be seated now as our service is about to begin. Well, good morning, everyone. Here in this, uh, everyone here in the sanctuary and those watching virtually, welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of the South Jersey Shore. We ask that you please place your cell phones on worship mode. And I forgot to do that myself. Okay, there it is, worship mode. Uh, thank you for joining us, those who bring a teaching of hope, who welcome all in our doors. We welcome all in our doors, the joyful, the heartbroken, the atheist and Christian, Muslim and Jews, straight and gay, lesbian, bisexual, queer, transgender, and all who are searching, seeking, and looking for more, more meaning, more service, more love. All of us gathered here together. My name is Paul, and I'm your worship associate this morning. I'm a charter member of this congregation and currently serve as treasurer. Our worship service today is led by Andy Cogill and John Scherfey, if uh, I don't know that John's here yet, of Eastern Service Workers Association. Andy Cogill grew up in Minnesota, and after gaining a variety of experience in community service, political organizing, and activism in Ecuador, San Jose, Boston, and elsewhere, he became a full-time volunteer organizer in 1999. For the last 13 years, Andy has been the operations manager for Eastern Service Workers Association in Pleasantville. John Scherfe grew up in Williamstown in a family with deep roots in South Jersey agricultural industry. John graduated from Stockton University in 2020 with a BS degree in chemistry. John began organizing full-time in 2021. After working as a chemist and running a small business, he now serves as Eastern Service Workers Administrative Assistant and Educational Coordinator. Video of today's service will be available on YouTube channel later today. To those gathered live on Facebook, we welcome your comments as well as your joys and sorrows on that platform. Please remember that this video will be on the internet, so do not share information best kept private. As has become our new tradition, we have some announcements at the beginning of service. Sign up for the June 3rd Circle Dinner, the final dinner of the Spring Circle Dinners, and they're a great way to get to know UU members and friends in a relaxed, small group atmosphere. Please consider joining us. The sign-up sheet is on the table in the rear of the sanctuary, and if you have any questions, see Marie or Betsy. Last call for poets and readers. Dag Dag Dagaverian is putting together a poetry service for June 25th. If you're interested in reading one or two poems or of your own or someone else's, please contact Debbie as soon as possible. Show off your creativity. The Greenlight Coffee House is making a comeback. We need people who are interested in making this happen. For those of you who do not know what the Greenlight Coffee House was, it was a one Friday a month evening at the UU Center offering entertainment for UUs and the general public. We, d we drew musicians, poets, comics from all over the area to entertain who was there. We served coffee, tea, and light snacks. It was fun and a chance for everyone to sing and dance and speak or whatever, all in front of a very appreciative audience. Anyone who wants to talk about this and bring it to fruition, please come to a planning meeting today in the library after service. Many hands make light work, and this, this, this takes some work, but is well worth the effort if, uh, if we get some people to get this together. Join us next Sunday for a holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y, uh, Music service featuring our music director, Gina Roche, and her wonderful band. Get ready for an all-music service, complete with a few sing-alongs, new compositions, and well-loved favorites. This holy music service will lift you up, leave you feeling connected, wholly contented, and inspired. This is probably an excellent service if you've been thinking about asking friends or family or other potential interested people in coming to a service. This is probably a great first service for them to attend, because huh, it's Gina and her band. Um, welcome to worship.
welcome into this place of healing. Welcome into this place of challenge and of growth. Welcome into this place of imperfection and aspiration. Here you are whole. Here you are holy. Here you are wholly loved. Our chalice lighter this morning is our board president and ESW volunteer, Marty Quish. Please look in your order of service and read along with me the chalice lighting words. We are not alone because of our promises to love one another. We are not alone because we are companions on the journey. We grow ourselves into allies, helping one another get free. Because none of us is truly free until we are all free. Our stewardship chair, Karen York, will come up to the podium now to tell us about the status of our stewardship drive. After the gathering, well, it says the gathering. I, I got the script, the gathering hymn comes next. Good morning, I'm Karen York and I'm the stewardship chair and I've been asked to give a, a summary of how our stewardship campaign uh, uh, ended and there was a note in the midweek announcements at the end of the stewardship campaign if you want to go back and look at that uh, but we ended uh, with just under 123,000 in financial commitments by members and friends of the congregation and uh, which was 90% of our goal that was a stretch goal and that is uh, to encourage us to give as much as uh, possible it does, uh, the financial commitments that we got do represent growth over last year, so we are moving in the right direction and building our new way, as our uh, theme uh, indicated. Uh, it is our aspiration to be able to uh, support and sustain a minist ministry, uh, a minister, uh, at least part-time, but we're not quite there yet. So at this point, we're building a budget uh, based on 125,000 in uh, financial commitments uh, to continue to be lay-led. That's all, and uh, thank you. Thank you, Karen, for all the work you do on that campaign and all the work you do for our congregation. We really, I don't know where we'd be without you, quite frankly. Uh, our gathering hymn today is number six, Please Rise in Body or Spirit and Sing Just As Long As I Have Breath, hymn number six.
Disappointments pierced me through. Still I kept on loving you. If they ask what I did best, tell them I said yes to love. We will now light the children's religious education lantern. We light this lantern for our children and youth and for us, celebrating the, the flame of faith lighted in each of us, honoring the light each of us brings into the world, rejoicing in community that we create together. I think we're a little short on kids today, but the children will now collect donations for the local food pantries, animal shelter, and the Coalition Against Rape and Abuse. Lately, our food donations have been going to the Eastern Service Workers. is provided in the foyer in which you are encouraged to write whatever joys and sorrows you have. I will now read what you have shared. Um, a joy that Janet Longo's service auction item of a brunch in the garden was a wonderful event, even if the weather didn't cooperate. 20-plus UU friends and families enjoyed an extensive brunch, good conversation, and a walk through Janet Longo's beautiful garden. It made for an excellent experience, and we thank you, Janet. And there's another one here for Janet. Thank you, Janet, for a lovely breakfast in the garden. The raindrops on the trees were magical. And that, <laughs> it, it's true. It really was. It, it was beautiful. It was beautiful. Let us now share a quiet time together to reflect on our week. During the musical interlude, you may come forward and place a pebble in the water to acknowledge a personal joy or sorrow.
Let us be in the spirit of prayer. Blessed and holy creation, universe of wonder, mystery beyond definition, we share today our joys and sorrows, listening deeply to the things that cause us to weep or worry, and lifting our hearts as one at those things we would celebrate together. Our hearts are touched by this shared ritual, and we are connected. We hold in our hearts this morning all those who need housing and food security, and like all of us, desire a better life for their children. We pray for the people of Ukraine and other war torn areas that true peace will find them soon. We pray for those who are apart from us, whether by distance, time, or conflict unresolved. We pray for those who thirst, whether for water, dignity, or justice. We pray for those who are in danger and who yearn for safety. We pray for our small, blue, fragile planet. Amen. Offering is a sacrament of the free church. It is supported by volunteer generosity of all who join us. More than 80% of our annual budget is supported by direct pledges and donations collected through our in-service offering. We hope that you will be as generous as you are able and support the ministry of this congregation. If this is your first time here, let the basket pass. Your present is truly gift enough. You can also text a donation, 609-293-4495. Or for those participating online, please visit us at uucsjs.org and click on the yellow Donate button for ways to donate. The gifts of the congregation will now be most gratefully received. The ushers will now collect your offering. Thank you.
we'd now like to welcome John and Andy up. Jorge and Marta, can you guys stand? Okay, great. It's so wonderful to be here among friends and uh, so wonderful to be able to give you an update on all the support that UU has been providing and, and uh, how we're working together to change our community. Uh, my name is Andy Kogel. I'm a full-time volunteer and the operations manager of Eastern Service Workers Association. I want to introduce John Scherfee. He is the uh, operations manager in training, the administrative assistant, and also a full-time volunteer, what we call a cadre, part of the backbone of the organization. Here with us is Martha, Marine, uh, Martha Mejia, excuse me, uh, a, uh, a member and a volunteer. Uh, she works at Capri Pizza uh, in Northfield uh, for the last three years. Um, she was uh, not only with us today, but volunteering uh, on Friday, uh, multiple, multiple hours, assisting John on a food drive and signing up additional volunteers in front of uh, Tilton Market in Northfield. Um, also with us is Jorge Madrid. Jorge is, uh, for over 10 years, a member of our advisory committee and a volunteer um, working, what, how many jobs is it now, Jorge? Three, two, three jobs? <laughs> and social work and uh, running his own cleaning business. So we came to talk specifically uh, about something called the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, how many folks have heard of the Sustainable Development Goals? Oh, very good, Yvette. <laughs> Oh, so about a third, okay. Um, if you haven't heard about them, uh, you, you <laughs> uh, don't be surprised, because uh, John is gonna go some, through some statistics about the a survey that was done last year in the nation, and it shows that the visibility of them is extremely low in this country. Um, but first, let me back up and just briefly, for those that are unfamiliar, just introduce East Eastern Service Workers. So we are an organizing drive of service workers. Uh, our members work as housekeepers, food service workers, independent contractors, farm workers, everything in between. Uh, our membership does the work that makes the economy of South Jersey run, you know, by definition. Uh, but the jobs tend to be low wage uh, with little or no benefits. Since 1977, uh, we've joined together to build self-help solutions to our poverty conditions. Uh, accepting no government funding or any other funding with string, strings attached, run entirely by volunteers from top to bottom. So I'm curious, is anyone in the congregation today working uh, more than one job? Yes, okay. All right. Do you mind sharing with us what kind of jobs? If, if you're okay, if you don't mind, yeah. Been working for uh, businesses in Linwood, uh, in the Diner, uh -huh. and I also had side work I did as a staff person for the contractor who does the site cleaning and contractor who does the cleaning. Very good. So I had both of those two jobs and all the hats. <laughs> Yeah, the John just asked a good question. How many folks have family that's in a similar situation? <laughs> well, yeah, and that's the majority of the community. And that's a picture of what's happening in our economy where increasingly more and more folks that, that have an advanced degree or have a uh, professional experience are in the same boat. Uh, over 90% of jobs in a recent 10-year period were so-called contingent jobs, part-time, temporary, or independently contracted. Uh, typically, these have few benefits, no job security. The unionization rate in the country is down to 6% for the private workforce from 35%, which is what it was uh, at its height in the 1950s. So it's not surprising that Americans now spend 33% of their monthly income to repay creditors. Uh, that's done including mortgage debt. And only one in three Americans can comfortably cover a $400 emergency. Nearly 40% of Americans skipped medical care last year because they couldn't afford it. 
So we run an 11-point benefits program to cover some of the immediate needs, some of the survival necessities that our members have. Food, clothing, preventive medical and dental care, legal advice. Marty's going to be giving some examples in a minute about his participation in some of those things. Paul has also been coming down and getting direct experience in the advocacy. But our primary benefit is the benefit of having an organization. We know that there's strength in unity, there's strength in numbers, and through strong organization, we can fight for better living and working conditions. So that's why our members endorsed the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development after it was passed by the, Uni by the United Nations in 2015. And John's going to explain a little bit more about that. Thank you. All right. So there's a big sign to my right. Um, I'm going to describe a little bit more. So um, uh, like Andy said, these were passed in 2015 at the United Nations. They were goals to be achieved by 2030. Um, it includes 17 goals, under which, not listed down here, are 169 specific targets. Um, it's very specific about what these goals are. It includes recommendations for how nations should proceed to implement these goals. The idea of standalone development is that every nation ev and local community should aim for a triple bottom line, economic prosperity, social justice, and environmental sustainability. The first goal here, number one, is very important to our organization as well, end poverty, right? End poverty in all its forms everywhere. And it's a, just to give you some particular examples about how detailed these sub goals are and how really achievable these things can be, you know, it's a, uh, one of the sub-goals is reduce at least by half the proportion of men, women, and children of all ages living in poverty in its dimensions according to national def definitions. It's a very specific goal. This would mean reducing the poverty rate in half of, uh, of Atlantic City from 37%, which it is today, to 19% by 2030 without simply pushing the poor out into another town. In Atlantic City, that means, that means uh, you know, um, uh, pulling 7,000 people out of poverty by 2030. In Camden, that means 15,000 people out of poverty by 2030. The 10th goal here, to reduce inequality among, na among uh, countries, calls for each nation, within each nation, to progressively achieve and sustain income growth of the bottom 40% of the population at a rate higher than the national average. In the US, this means that those making lower than $50,000 a year will have a higher income growth than the other 60% by 2030. These are very specific, clear goals, not abstract. Each of these goals to end hunger, to ensure healthy lives, to achieve gender equality, to ensure access to affordable energy, and to take urgent action to address climate change are just as specific. So Andy was just doing a little poll of the room here, finding out you know, who is familiar with the SDGs. It's great to see it like uh, a third Usually I go in classes in, at Stockton and do presentations and it's lower than that. It's like one person maybe. And chances are, like Andy was just saying, the general population, it's, you know, uh, you know, um, um, tw 50, not informed, every, absolutely. Thank you. And Colby, you should be up here with us, but Colby has COPD, she can't speak too much, but she's, she's, a, she's, she's a fighter. Anyway, we've picked up these goals to publicize them because we need to put these goals in for the well-being of all of us here. That's what I got. So we have to kind of grapple with the fact that unfortunately our leaders, especially on the national level, have not been serious about pursuing these goals, even though they were part with the leaders of all the countries of the world in passing them in 2015. Uh, the federal government across multiple administrations has done very little to even publicize the goals and even less to implement and recommend them. A two thirds, actually uh, three quarters, 74% of Americans either have never heard of them or they heard of them but they have no idea what they are. So here's a quote from a report on the implementation of the sustainable development goals. We can call them the SDGs, like they're typically called. Um, this report was just issued uh, a few months ago. It said the SDGs were designed with the goal to leave no one behind. 
But halfway to 2030, halfway, that promise is in peril. The SDGs are disappearing in the rear view mirror and with them the hope and rights of current and future generations. A fundamental shift is needed in commitment, solidarity, and action. That's from the UN. So just as an example, the United States, uh, you know, can kind of trumpet the fact that in a on a global scale, there's more access to, to sanitation than in many countries of the world. But the figure has been 98% for years. Now 2% doesn't sound like much, but that means there's 6.6 .6 million people in this country, which is about the population of Indiana, the state of Indiana, who don't have access to sanitation, to clean drinking water, for example. As an example of that, uh, you might remember last year, last summer, in Mississippi, there was a city with 150,000 people, Jackson, that went without clean, clean water, the, the immediate impact was a climate-related event, but it was compounded, it had that impact because of years and years of lack of infrastructure investment in poor communities and in communities of color. So we see the, the impacts that things are not, it's not like there's a trajectory to reduce that 2% and get sanitation to the 6.6 .6 million people, but rather things are going in the opposite direction for more and more of us. So there are some real material reasons to care about this. It affects all of our lives. There are also some very compelling um, connections between the principles of the UU congregation and the UU community and these very sustainable development goals. Consider the first principle of the seven principles is the inherent worth and dignity of every person. The second, the call for uh, justice, equity, and compassion in human relations. The fifth, the use of democratic processes within society. The sixth, the goal of world community with peace, liberty, and justice for all. And the seventh, cherishing the interdependent web of all existence of which we're a part. I, understand uh, from you know many months now years of working with Colby the kind of approach that it's not a dogma not a doctrine but more of a living tradition of you know using these strong values and moral guides to guide action I see that then in what the increasing numbers of you you members have been demonstrating in practice what I'm seeing when they're doing the advocacy, when they're joining us on canvases and other activities. <coughs> and Marty has been filling me in on, and I might get some of the details wrong, I apologize, but the idea of the UU Faith Action and the committees or task forces that are taking on different areas of social justice. Um, kind of building on that more than you know, two century tradition that the UUs have from dealing with, with uh, abolition of slavery and the, equal and, and the women's suffrage movement and so forth. Um, if you look at some of those goals that the UU Faith Action has, the first two, economic justice and environmental justice, fall directly within that. Two others, immigration reform and criminal justice reform, you know, we have a saying in, in, in our office, ADSWA, that immigration law really is labor law because so many of the policies are rooted in the motive of corporations to obtain cheap labor. Similarly, criminal law, much of the whole system is shaped by economic concerns, like the 13th Amendment, which legalizes the ability to have forced labor as a punishment for a crime. So as a community of volunteers with the SWA, we see increasingly how UU members are putting their faith into action. And and the form that we're taking is both the direct services in conjunction with a struggle, a fight to hold our government institutions accountable to the promises that they've made and haven't kept. As I said, the federal government has done very little to even publicize the goals, much less pursue them. 
And so we believe that government institutions must be held accountable for the progress that they agreed to but have failed to make to achieve the goals. To take a single example, our government's commitment was to end poverty in the US by 2030. John gave some very specific examples of how that could be carried out on the local level. Instead, the gap between the rich and poor has grown, reaching unprecedented levels. The United States has falling life expectancy, stagnant or falling you know, measures of happiness, major epidemics of opioids with the record number killed just this last year, 110,000, record levels of depression, obesity, and losses from climate-related disasters. And as I said, the idea of sustainable development is that every nation and local community should aim for a triple bottom line, economic prosperity, social justice, and environmental sustainability. And the United States ranks so low on the index of sustainable development goals, in particular because our whole political and economic framework is putting its entire emphasis on what they call economic growth, but we can also just say it's profit over social fairness and over environmental protection. We see that in hostility to labor unions, in policies like tax cuts for the very top 1%, weak pollution control, and limited social safety net. While sustainable development is supposed to rest on three legs, economic, social, and environmental, the US economy teeters precariously on just that one economic leg ready to tumble down in social conflict and environmental mayhem. So, um, I'm at a loss for words, I'm sorry. <laughs> we have a saying, there will be no recovery until the paychecks start to go out. South Jersey's economy in this era um, is nothing like what it has been in the past. Not to sort of wax, you know, poetic about the past, but Colby can tell you some examples of how she grew up in Vineland, you know, with a single income and her family supporting the whole family. And that's a thing that not many of us can relate to anymore. That kind of economy had strengths for local residents that many of us, you know, don't see. There were, for example, in Atlantic City alone, in the pre-casino era, there were far more grocery stores, movie theaters, locally owned restaurants, independent retail locations, the crucial difference is that more money was earned and spent on a local level. People simply had more money in their pocket. One indication is in 1980, the Atlantic City Chamber of Commerce reported that of 2,100 businesses operating in Atlantic City in 1976, only about 210 will be left by 1985. And much of that uh, destruction is in fact what happened. So while no one would argue that our region returned to the economy of that era, there is something that we can learn from it to make a better future for all of us. Healthy communities have residents whose resources can sustain them, pay workers a living wage, and the money flows upward, spurring economic activity throughout the rest of the economy, raise incomes from the bottom, and everyone else can only do better. But raising incomes from the bottom takes a fight, a struggle. As Frederick Douglass said a few years before the Civil War, he said, if there is no struggle, there is no progress. Those who profess to favor freedom and yet deprecate agitation are people who want crops without plowing up the ground. They want rain without thunder and lightning. They want the ocean without the awful roar of its many waters. Power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did and it never will. So that is the struggle in which we're engaged and in which you can join us, and many of you are. <laughs> All of you, really, through the congregation support. Over more than four decades, ESW has established a track record of self-help efforts demonstrating ability and resolve. Our members are the lowest paid service workers, as you know, and that means it's so impressive that members are, you know, about 80% of our volunteer base. Right now, as I speak, we've got a team that John just left, that's why he came in, rushing in, that's out at the uh, Mayf Mayfest in Smithville for the second day. We did the best we could in the rain yesterday, and now we're out there today 
finding out more people who are able to help them throughout the region. While two of our members, uh, one of whom similarly works multiple jobs and is refilling his carburetor to, to be able to get his car down to the office or running office to keep it open to fill emergency food for us, answer the phone, because it's open seven days a week from nine to nine, always staffed by volunteers. So federal and state officials are working against the interests that we're trying to advance as working communities to, to better ourselves by continuing to make budgetary decisions for our local communities in the interest of you know, large financial interests at the expense of people who live and work here. We see that the policies that put money in at the bottom of our communities must be fought to ensure living wages for workers in South Jersey and in the country. And then people will spend that money in our local economies and continue fighting to end the policies that are squeezing us dry, such as the utility profiteering, privatizing our water, shutting off tens of thousands of low-income workers' gas or electricity. The reason why we organize an, our extensive self-help benefits program of clothing and emergency food and supplemental food distributions and preventive medical and dental benefits and optical care and utility advocacy to prevent shutoffs and legal advice for volunteer attorneys, all of this being done you know, by and for our low-income workers is to engage ultimately not just for those immediate necessities, but because we have to engage in that struggle that Frederick Douglass talked about. So we, along with our sister organizations and other grassroots and non-government organizations across the country, are among a growing number of groupings in the United States calling on our government to keep its word and, and first publicize <laughs> the 2030 Sustainable Development Goals so we can know these commitments that were made and then actually implement them. It's not something that we can do alone, but we have to hold them accountable and show that gap. It's the gap between the income and expenses that we're experiencing is a reflection of that gap between the promises and the actual implementation that we see happening. So, you know, just to be real <laughs> for a minute, you know, we have on a regular basis, you know, volunteers just on the college campus that we're meeting, who are so aware of this and how it's just constraining all of our futures. But one of our volunteers called with regret yesterday, I mean Friday, excuse me, and you know, Martha stepped up and filled in. He said, I can't come because in addition to being a Stockton student and supporting his disabled mother and his siblings, he's working full time in retail for J. Crew and working for two driving jobs, you know, Grubhub and DoorDash. It's the gig economy, you know, that we see just day after day, and it's really clear that there's two organizing drives. <laughs> there's the drive to, you know, take more and more of our economic futures from us, and then along with us, everything else that's sustainable, including our precious planet, and then there's the organizing drive that we mobilize together. And you, you has, you know, as I said, dem been demonstrating how much you're behind that. And we see that. And we're so appreciative. And I just want you to know that, that I believe that this, or <laughs> this organizing drive is making headway. And so I encourage you to, to join with Marty, join with Paul, join with Colby, join with Yvette, you know, so many others that are, um, you know, not letting the difficulty, as Barb, <laughs> so many uh, who see a way forward, not to become discouraged, but to continue to fight forward. Because really it's about, you know, taking something that can seem quite abstract, quite dry, and in the same manner that you do with the principles that you, you have sustained now for many years, you, it's faith in action, it's, a, it's about doing that same thing, you know, as we fight for a better future and, and a living wage. So I want to pass it on to Marty so that he can, you know, do better than I can in terms of just giving a few material examples of his participation as an example of what every UU member can do.
thank you both for being here and doing such an important job in our community. Um, what I never realized was the need that was in Atlanta County. Um, as a part-time resident for almost 20 years and now a full-time resident for the past six years, I never really realized the drastic need of, of the people in, in Atlanta County. And Eastern Service Workers um, has just reached out and has been just a lifeline to so many of them. Um, there really is two forms of advocacy. One is a benefit ad advocacy um, with members to help close the gap between income and expenses. Um, this helps stabilize a member's situation, freeing them up to be more participatory in our collective effort. And what that means, in, in layman's terms, is they come and, and whatever they need, they, they come. Um, and when I've been a volunteer there, there's been somebody walking in the door, it seems like every minute. Um, the, one of the first times I was there, a woman um, was had an, a partner that was very seriously ill and had um, not round the clock nursing, but um, from like seven to five. And um, she, need, she needed to, um, she had quit her job and she needed a, to find another job now that, now that her partner was getting, was stabilizing and she had help during the day. Um, but she could only work through certain, certain hours and she had specific things that she needed. Um, and we went to the, jo to the job bank, which is next door, and, and got her an application and she came in and she um, filled it out and she got an appointment for the next day um, and came back the next day and went over and, and, and did do the interview to obtain employment. Um, other times when I was there, we, we, um, I called the utility companies and agencies um, because the, the, the um, effects of COVID were expiring, um, where they gave everybody breaks of not paying their bills, and now all of a sudden that was ending. And um, I called in to find out what each agency was gonna, was gonna be doing in the future. Um, <coughs> that same day while I was there, there was a family that came in, um, a grandmother, two, um, two of her da married daughters with their children. There was about eight or 10 people there, and um, it was the first time they walked in the door. <sighs> And um, they were all living in one apartment in Atlantic City. Uh, the husbands worked two jobs, um, but I think there was probably 12 people living in the, in the small apartment. And um, they were fine with food, they said, but they really needed clothing. Um, and there was an 11-year-old boy that really needed clothing, and we really couldn't help him that much. There really wasn't a lot of clothes that day for an 11-year-old boy, uh, but some of the, the girls and, and some of the adults got what they needed. Um, also, the second part is um, canvassing small business communities um, to get sponsors and gain new support for these all volunteer efforts. Uh, examples of the concerns of the small business owners share, share with us as we go. Um, some of them were, uh, especially the restaurants in Atlanta County, pizzerias, um, even nail salons um, that we have canvassed, they were hurt tremendously through COVID. Um, and even though they did get relief, um, a lot of that just wasn't relief enough, let's say. Um, but we canvassed these, these businesses in Atlanta County to get them to, to see if they can be sponsors. Um, most all of them are very receptive um, to reaching out and helping, although they barely are getting by themselves. Uh, the last time I went out with Andy, um, probably the, just about a couple of weeks ago, we met a pharmacist um, a, an independent pharmacy on the Black Horse Pike um, who agreed to fill prescriptions um, for free um, for the people that come into Eastern Service Workers, which there is a lot of people that come in and that need medication and they can't afford to pay them. They don't have, they don't have medical insurance. Um, and this one pharmacist, you know, um, said, yes, you know, you call me the next time you have someone come in. And he said, I will make sure that I write, I get them the prescription that they need. And he's one of many. Um, that, that we're working on. Um, but those are two of the examples. One more before I'll, I'll leave with one more. <coughs> Excuse me, the last time I was there, there was a 19 year old woman from uh, Peru and um, she wanted to become a citizen and she was here on a work visa. And so I helped her um, fill out the citizenship application, which I never realized is 18 pages long and it's daunting. Um, she could not speak any English. 
Um, she spoke uh, Peruvian, and um, but John and Andy showed me on on the phone to get an app where she would write down, she would fill out each page, and I would scan it and use an app that would translate it, and then I would write the application out for this young woman. Um, but it was 18 pages, and I I was like, oh my God, why is it 18 pages? Um, but anyway, there's, you never know when you're there what's going to walk in the door and who's going to need help. Um, and it, it's just been a, a remarkable experience for me. Um, it, it, I just, as I said in the beginning, I never realized the amount of help that, that people out there need. Um, and I'm just really very, very thankful that Eastern Service Workers is there to support them. That was great, Marty. Thank you so much for that. And uh, so John's going to make a brief announcement, and then we'll wrap up. If you'll permit me for one minute, I'd just like to go over a few other things. Um, so, uh, um, so, so, so how do we organize workers? So a lot of workers, you know, live and work these gig jobs, so not in the same place. You know, six, six months later, they might be doing a different job. So we organize residentially. Um, number one, because the jobs change so quickly, and number two, it kind of it makes so, so so that we can talk to folks about workplace conditions without fear of being, you know, kicked off the job while talking about trying to get together on the job, right? Um, so we we every Saturday we're out in Atlantic City, we're out in Pleasantville, you know, reaching low-income workers, holding house meetings, um, to getting workers to talk, talking about these kind of conditions and what we can do to change them. So we urgently need volunteers every Saturday. Um, to join us on these Canvas campaigns, especially those of us who are able-bodied, can move around a little bit, especially if you're habla espanol, if, you, if you're bilingual, that's great. Um, number two, you know, in this, you know, just to preface all this, um, how we're going to change these things, ultimately it takes leadership, right? Um, look at all the movements for change, other movements for change always have leadership behind them, so we always need full-time volunteer organizers first and foremost. Um, but uh, that's not for everybody, but that is, that is what we're calling out for. That's what I'm presenting about. Um, and one final thing, if anybody here, we, we urgently need a volunteer doctor. Um, um, talk to me after the presentation if you're interested. I'll tell you more. Uh, that's what I got. Great. I hope everyone can join us on July 23rd. We're having our 46th anniversary celebration. It's going to be in donated space at the Our Lady Star of the East Church in Pleasantville. And uh, one of our goals, as John said, is by that date, by July 23rd, to be able to relaunch our 20-year tradition of doing a monthly general medical session where we provide uh, you know, preventive, non-emergency uh, donated uh, medical care uh, that pharmacy can be a part of it. So uh, to do that, we have to meet more doctors because we need a volunteer general or family practitioner to step up and, and help us relaunch these sessions. So, to learn more about it, we're going to be circulating uh, after the service. I really encourage everyone to, to take a minute to talk to uh, Martha, Jorge, or John, or myself and learn more about ways that you can, um, you're already involved, you can get more involved. So we appreciate it so much. Thank you so much. So yes, I've had the opportunity to volunteer over at the Eastern Service Workers, and uh, they do a toy drive at Christmas, they do food drives during the various holidays, and the need is really great. There is always need for especially gently used shoes uh, of, for all ages, clothing uh, for all ages, uh, including work clothing, um, and, and of course your checkbook is, is, is always helpful. And you know, you, you see those 17 sustainable goals, and they look so overwhelming that I want to give you the parable that my sister Jessica, you, you from Davis is fond of. Two people are walking on the beach and it's covered with dying starfish. And every now and then uh, one of them bends over and throws the starfish in the ocean and they're doing this on a continual basis. Eventually the friend says, you know, what are you doing? There's thousands and thousands of starfish dying here. What difference can you possibly make? He picks up another starfish, throws it in the ocean, says, made a difference to that one. Well, you can make a difference to that one too. And if you do some advocacy work there or, or help them with their membership drives, four hours here and there, two hours, whatever you can provide, it's always helpful and the need is great. And it, I assure you, it will make a difference to that one. Let us 
Uh, let me see here. Where are we? Um, oh, okay. Please rise now in body or spirit and joining, join us in singing our closing hymn, number 121, Will Bit of Land. And we're only going to sing verses 1, 2, and 4 because the syncopation in number 3 is just too difficult. <laughs> Let us read the words. To, oh, first, I want to thank John and Andy for coming in and their helpers for speaking with us and yeah. Marty for helping out. And also for Michael for being one of our guest musicians and Cynthia for playing the piano. <laughs> so great. Uh, let us read the words together for extinguishing the chalice. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again.
We warmly welcome. <laughs> we warmly welcome all of you who are visiting us today and remind you that next week will be a music filled service and encourage you to to invite some people to attend. Now let us share in a moment of silent reflection to consider today's message and the meaning it has in our lives. <laughs> 